Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started and we'll just let the others join us as they come in. Uh, my name is Randy Ferguson, Director of Marketing and Communications here at Ernst Conservation Seeds. And we just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, extend our appreciation to each of you for joining us this afternoon. This is our first ever High Noon Education Series event. So uh, you're kind of a pilot group for us, if you will. Um, We've done a lot of these over the last few months as participants ourselves, but this is our first foray into offering online webinars. So we hope you enjoy this today and get something good out of it. And by all means, we would also ask you to give us some feedback afterwards. If you have any thoughts on how the presentation went, please let us know. Um, I will ask everybody as we go through today, we have you by default. Um, muted and we have your video disabled as well just because obviously for a webinar it would get a little cumbersome if we had 40 people trying to interact back and forth. Um, please do take advantage of the chat feature which you should see down um, in the bottom of your system tray there. If you have questions as we go through the presentation feel free to type those in. If there's anything that I can field while Greg's going through his presentation I'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise, what we'll do at the very end, Greg will reserve five, 10 minutes at the end of his presentation so that uh, we can go ahead and answer any of those questions. So you do want to use that chat feature if you have a question because that's the best way for us to manage those questions for you and handle them all at the end of the presentation. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Greg Kudzerski to you. He's our plant materials specialist and he's going to, uh, take control of the presentation at this point. Greg, go ahead. Well, thank you, Randy. Uh, I really wanted to give Randy and HR marketing and uh, communications team a big thank you. Uh, last couple of days, been kind of uh, uh, fraught with some, some ups and downs and we got through it. And um, so today, uh, thanks again for coming in and uh, joining us for our, our inaugural uh, um, Noonday uh, webinar, and what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, how burnt or earns conservation seeds um, bioengineering from product harvest to installation tips for more successful planting. What is bioengineering? Soil bioengineering is the applied science that combines engineering principles with biological and ecological concepts to construct and ensure the survival of living plants used in these communities. Um, bioengineering materials are live, dormant, advantageous, uh, rooting and shooting native tree and shrub species that can be used on stream, wetlands, or slope stabilization uh, projects that will grow when uh, properly uh, installed or inserted into the soils of these projects. Um, some of the, also what I call the other bioengineering materials are the uh, potted uh, tree and shrub materials that are used on these projects. The uh, plant materials that come in um, containerized stock or, um, you know, 50 cell trays or whatever you want to call them, and the seeds that go on to these projects. So when I say adventitious rooting and shooting um, species, we're talking about trees and shrubs that when cut dormant, uh, will produce roots and shoots. And some of the things you can see in the picture right now um, are uh, basically all shrub species. Uh, they were harvested um, two years ago, dormant, uh, and the dormant season for uh, bioengineering materials is usually late October through uh, May, going into June. Uh, in some regions, that's a little bit late. In our region, things are just starting to break uh, dormancy at that point. So those stems were harvested, they were bare, there were no roots or shoots on them, and uh, what we did is uh, cut them to one foot lengths, stuck them in uh, grow out beds, and this is what you get. Uh, they produce the roots and they produce the shoots you see there within about a two-year period. Um, there's really no uniformity to how these things grow or where the, the shoots or the stems or the, the roots come from, it's, it's just kind of random. Uh, but as you can see, um, when we harvested some of these things, we did break off some of the stems and we did break off quite a bit of the root material and that's just goes with uh, um, um, things, you know, when you're out there in the wild harvesting. Again, these are not live stakes. 
or light pole material. This is just something that I'm using to kind of give you a, an idea of, of um, how the, materi the uh, materials react when planted. Some of the common species used in bioengineering practices and uh, are shown right here. And these species are the ones that I feel are best suited to most of the bioengineering practices that I see uh, recommended or spec'd um, on, on a lot of projects. Um, mainly what I see a lot of is black willow. You'll see, I have it ranked number seven. Um, I'm, I'm big on biodiversity. Um, I see a lot of specs and they're usually three species, black willow, red osier dogwood and elderberry. Um, for me, I prefer to see um, a, a lot of biodiversity. Um, why is it saying my internet connection is unstable? Um, I prefer to see a lot of bio or a lot of biodiversity on site. And what I have ranked number one, two, three, four, five, and six, I think are the best um, adventitious rooters and shooters that can be used on a project. Um, they're all shrub tree species architecture. And what that means is they grow uh, multi uh, stems. At maturity, they're probably no uh, taller than about 20 or 25 feet tall. And um, they really do a good job just as well as Black Willow um, does as holding the soils on your project. Um, and I think they grow just as well or even better in some situations. I do have American Sycamore down there. Um, I do like that also. Um, it does well in some situations, um, but um, it's one of those that are, it's, it's kind of hit or miss. The um, subspecies are on the left. I think the best one that out there is the silk dogwood. It's overall, I think, the best grower in all situations, whether you're, you're installing this on a stream restoration project you're putting it through riprap, you're uh, using it in modeling, or if you're doing a uh, uh, Russian branch layering installation. Uh, I see a lot of red osier dogwood out there, and I have it marked in half black and half red. Um, it's kind of a niche grower to me. Um, I would never put it through riprap. I would never uh, in uh, maybe a slope stabilization, uh, going from uh, 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 obligate to uh, back upland. I would never use it in that situation because it really does not grow well. It, it, it's a weak grower and it really needs that niche um, situation. Gray dogwood to me is probably, out of all the dogwood species used in bioengineering, it's probably one of the worst ones used. Uh, it does work. Um, but I would say the percentage of um, Overall success using gray dogwood is somewhere in the 20%, 25% range. Um, elderberry does very well. It's a limited species. There's not a lot of it out there, but I, I do like it um, in the biodiversity mix, um, as well as button bush, nine bark, cranberry. All those species do very, very well. Uh, arrowwood and nannyberry, to me, um, are better left for uh, nursery growing uh, in, in a very, um, well-maintained, uh, uh, coddled situation. Uh, those are the only times that I really feel that those viburnums do well in that situation. So moving on, I'm gonna show you, like I said, uh, the architecture, basic plant architecture at maturity. The uh, shrub style plant on the left is a, is a stream co willow that's about 27 years old. Um, it has that classic shrub style, multi-stemmed, um, kind of goes up and, and mushrooms out at the top, lots of branching, um, lots of, you know, produces a lot of leaves, um, produces a lot of good habitat. I know that thing's 27 years old because uh, I started at Ernst about 17 years ago and they had planted this section of a uh, field plot that we use for harvesting. 10 years beforehand, we just never ever harvested that one plant. And so at maturity, it, it's reached, you know, about 25 feet. The classic tree style uh, architecture uh, on the right there in the center 
is a um, peach leaf willow. And that thing is about 35 years old, 35, 40 years old. And it's well over 70 feet tall. It has that classic single leader stem or trunk, and then it breaks off into a bunch of different leaders. Um, one of the reasons I don't really like using tree style um, bioengineering materials, especially on a flashy stream, say in an urban area or maybe a suburban area, is uh, they, they have a tendency to be weak. Uh, the wood is weak, and when they get tall, they tend to break. Um, they do tip out a little bit, especially in flashy streams that may be getting undercut or something like that. And when they tip out, uh, a bunch of different things can uh, happen, especially when it's a 40 or 50 foot tall tree. Um, like I said, I am, I'm really partial to the um, shrub style architecture um, willows and uh, shrub species. We here at Ernst do uh, two types of uh, harvest styles. We used to do a lot of wild harvesting, basically going out to people's property and harvesting, say, um, an old pasture or uh, an old dairy farm or something like that that they've allowed to grow up. And uh, we would go in there, remove the materials. We would pay the, uh, the landowner, and then we would bring back the material to our um, uh, facility to process it into your order. Every order when ordering from Ernst Conservation Seeds is custom cut. Uh, we don't cut things ahead of time and then um, store them for a while and, and send them out to you. We take your order. Your order is received and placed in the order that it was received in, and we cut each one. Usually the material for your order is uh, cut seven days prior to it shipping. Um, I see a lot of specs out there where they're asking that it be cut two to three days prior to, but um, that would just be an impossibility um, unless, um, you know, it's a smaller order or something like that. The other way we do it, and, and I prefer this method, is the field grown method. Uh, the reason being is you can't stop succession. So when you wild harvest, when you remove all the uh, biomass off that field there, um, other things tend to move in. It may be willow in the beginning. Three years later, it's dogwood. Then it's, it's something else. Our field grown plots, we can plant uh, silky willow. We can plant uh, a, a black willow. We could plant anything. And we know that when we harvest it, we maintain it just for those species so that we are able to eliminate anything else that might be growing in there. Also, it's for ease of operations. We can go in there, bring out a lot of material, not have to travel five, 10 miles away from our facility, um, which takes time uh, and money and, um, it, it produces a better crop for us. So after you've harvested it, we take it into uh, our temporary wet side storage. We actually have a facility just for um, bioengineering product uh, processing. The wet side is actually a large um, concrete facility. And you can see the um, things in the ceiling hanging down are overhead irrigation. The material comes in, it's placed in these racks. The racks are moved underneath our irrigation system. And basically what we do is we irrigate um, daily, um, keep the material fresh and live. Um, one thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna harvest materials on site somewhere and have them sitting out in the sun, the wind, you know, for one, two, three, four days. That's when things start drying out. That's when the viability of the plant material really starts to drop. You can also see in the on the far right side of the picture, we put our orders in the same area, the larger orders in the same area, so that they can uh, also benefit from being uh, irrigated and kept cool. Again, we we process uh, your orders individually. So the materials being brought out of the wet side bring into the dry side where, where the orders are processed. Any materials coming out of Ernst um, will be tagged with a species tag. 
Uh, it'll have the common name and it will have the um, scientific name on it. Also, the material that we bind our, our things together is uh, jute material and it's not treated. Um, you'll see that on spec sometime. Um, also, we try to be sustainable. So when we're harvesting and we're cutting and processing these orders, we usually um, will say live stakes between the basal diameter of a half an inch up to inch two inches. Reason being is if I tried to, or if we tried to fulfill orders with three quarter inch diameter material only or inch diameter material only, we would be throwing out a lot of material and that's something we don't want, really want to do. And it is a finite um, uh, commodity. Um, plus it, it's just more environmentally and ecologically sound. Some of the shipping methods that are, we do a lot of, um, for smaller orders, we do a lot of UPS or FedEx shipping. For larger orders, we do uh, those two orders right there, uh, the, the orders on the right-hand side that are pelletized. Um, if you receive that on your site, it's gonna have shrink wrap around it and it's gonna be cardboarded. What you can do, especially with a larger amount of stakes, you're not gonna be able to install um, you know, in a single day or maybe a week. You can just slice the top of that, take out the materials that you need, um, and then place that in a shady out of the way area. And you can water that material right in. That's something that we do recommend. When you get a box from FedEx or UPS, something you can do is just open it up. It'll be wrapped in plastic, open that plastic up. If you need to water it, they're usually watered prior to boxing. So they should be damp when you receive them. Um, water them down, you can stand them up inside the box, but they don't need to be sitting in the water um, for long periods of time or, or, or immersed. Or you can, a contractor can come right to our facility and pick up. And this was an order that just went out yesterday. It's about 40,000 or 30,000 stakes and they brought their own trailer. Again, put it all in there, we watered it down and they took it right off of their project. And they're, I believe they were from West Virginia. So when you receive all this stuff on site, um, you know, what's the best thing to do? Like I said, you can uh, keep it in a pallet, you can keep it in a box, or uh, especially if it's a smaller order. But when, you, when it is on site, uh, something that I do recommend is just taking it out and during the on-site installation, whether it is, you know, live stakes, like in the, in the two photos there, or wattles or branch layerings, bundles, something like that, you can also place them in the stream. Just be cognizant of the fact that if it is a flashy stream and uh, there's some weather moving in, uh, they will tend to float away. So I usually don't recommend putting the whole uh, kitten caboodle in the stream at one time. I kind of recommend that you stage them along your work area as much as you can do in a day or in, um, in uh, four hour periods. Um, put the butt ends in the water, or you can put the whole things in the water, it really doesn't matter. Um, as far as then taking them out of the water and moving them along on site, um, I usually recommend just getting a bucket, sticking the basal end into the bucket and taking, off, taking them off and putting them in uh, where, where they need to be put in. Basically that just ensures that while they're on site during installation, they're not drying down or or, or um, devastating. Um, I, I didn't go through like all the different installation styles, um, you know, whether it's a wattle or a branch layering or, or something like that, whole plant. Uh, installation is, is pretty much all the same. Uh, most important thing is more of the live stake, the pole, the uh, branch layering or the wattle in the ground. Um, overall, really uh, contributes to a better success at um, plant growth. So you see right there, we call that the jumping jack. That was something we, uh, we kind of made up ourselves so that we could do some of our own installations. 
on some of our properties. Um, basically, that's a, a piece of rebar with a handle on it, uh, a little angle welded onto it. You place it in the in the soils along the stream bank or in the wetlands or whatever. Just jump on that thing, rams a two foot hole into the ground, or or an eighteen inch hole or or however long the um, the long pointy end is, and then you feed your live stake down into it. I, um, I went ahead and poked a hole in the ground. You can see the arrow there pointing to it. The live stake is, is, is right next to it. I believe that's a two foot live stake. The left hand picture shows a proper installed live stake. That's two feet. You've got um, probably 16 plus inches in the ground. I tamped around it. You've got a little bit of water coming up from being so close to the uh, the shoreline of this wetlands right here. Um, everything looks good. You could angle that live stake a little bit if you wanted to, um, but it's not, I don't, I wouldn't believe that it would be washed away angling sometimes, uh, just better growth and, and, and then better uh, survivability if a water doesn't flash you on the stream or something like that. Also on a slope, you can angle them up a little bit uh, just so that the, the, the material does have an up, upwards grip when it does shoot out. Um, the photo on the right is kind of what I call a improperly installed live stake. Whether that's a three foot or a two foot live stake, that thing is not in the ground deep enough. Um, what'll happen, um, these things will root and shoot uh, pretty prodigiously, um, but you have more of the stake in the ground or the pole in, in the ground through the riprap, or uh, again, the um, branch layering in the ground. Um, what happens is uh, that kind of knows how much root um, to put out, how much is in the ground versus how much material is above ground. So what'll happen is in a properly installed live stake, probably put off too many shoots, um, not enough root material to sustain it as the um, summer months come on. So when you saw these in the spring or in the fall this year or the spring of next year and they start shooting and start rooting, what will happen is as it starts drying out, that material will um, start dying usually from the top down and the improperly um, uh, installed one. And basically the small root hairs that are generated in the wintertime and, and grow more as the um, soils warm up, uh, start to not be able to produce or, or, or push enough water up into the, into the state to, to maintain its viability. And like I said, it'll usually die from the top down. And then once, uh, all the um, Bible material that has shooted is dead. The live stake pretty much dries out. Um, so a few things that you can do to um, kind of forestall that, especially on you know on some of these variable sites, um, riprap or something like that, is I'd say trim it. You know, um, if you can only get um eight inches in the ground cut that thing down to two inches take the rest of that material that's that's there you can walk you know on the site somewhere stick that thing in the ground and you know still have uh, uh more growth um you're getting kind of a two one there um like i said i usually like to get about two-thirds or more of the material into the ground um, where some of these things really do um, survivability tends to go to go south is you know a pole planting through riprap. Um, you have a four foot stake and you're trying to insert it through two feet of riprap. You need at least a foot sticking out so that it can grow. You you might or might not get a foot into the soils behind the riprap. That's that's where things can kind of get. Um, uh, go awry. Uh, some things you can do to aid um, survivability uh, is you can dip them in 
something called uh, aquagel. Basically, it's polyacrylamide material. Uh, you mix it with water in a bucket. You can pour it down in the hole. You can dip your uh, stake in it. You can pour it over a branch layering in, into the trench of a wattle, um, place your material, backfill over it, or push it down into the hole or whatever you're going to do, build the next bench up. And uh, that material will be sitting against the, um, the live stake or the other bioengineering material. Um, and what it'll do is it'll pull the moisture out of the soil and keep it right along the, the, the bark area. And as things dry up, uh, it, it will uh, really aid in the survivability of your um, materials. One thing we don't do, we don't paint the um, tops of our uh, bioengineering materials. Um, basically, some people say to do that. I, I've really never found a better um, survivability that way. Um, what I have seen in the past is people just paint the, the tops of their live sticks different colors so that when they're going through there and they're doing their due diligence in uh, seeing what survived and what is not, they paint them different colors to know what survived and which is. Um, all of Ernst materials, especially our poles, our um, posts, or our live stick materials, usually the, the butt or the basal end will have a 45 degree angle cut on it. Um, the top will be flat. I don't recommend, you know, hammering these things in with a mallet. You can tap them in. Um, I recommend nibbling a hole or making a hole with something like you saw. Uh, what we call our jumping jack or piece of rebar, three, three quarters inch in diameter, an inch in diameter. Tap that, tap it down in the soil, wriggle it around, ring it around, pull it out, and slip the um, materials down into it that way. On bigger uh, materials, you can use something, uh, basically, I call it a stinger. It's a, um, it's really basically a hay bale spike. Uh, mounted on a plate, mounted to the front of a, a backhoe or a track hoe. It's, it's really used, I, I've seen it used with good success in uh, riprap installations where they just push a hole right in that they need. Um, they usually have the, the stick, the, uh, the uh, mark how deep they need to get it in. They pull it out and they try to whittle the material down into the hole that they had created. As far as um, some easier ways to poke holes in the ground, a lot of people will use a hammer drill, uh, portable or gas powered with a three foot bit. Uh, easy, easy installation that way also. That's, that's the end of it. Uh, saying it's the inaugural, I kind of went pretty easy on it. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to um, jump in or give me a call or let Randy know and uh, we do uh, we do have you. two questions here Greg that I can uh, sure. throw your way and these both came from Justin Campbell his first was and I think you did answer it after he asked this he was asking what percent or proportion of the stake should be buried as a helpful rule of thumb um, you we recommend two-thirds uh, I got that from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, out of one of their uh, Stream restoration design handbooks, and that was made, I think, back in the early 80s. But the more in the ground, the better the survivability. Okay. And his second question was, do you aim to bury below the water table or saturation zone, or is it okay to install in drier areas? It is okay, yes. So you really, I, I think when they... The Army Corps recommends it being installed into the Veto zone where it's able to draw on, on um, water. Um, but in the past, uh, and just through experience, we have found that you can go up slope with these things, especially if you're doing a, um, you know, a, uh, you're building benches up. You know, you're coming off the stream or you're coming up the slope and you're building these benches up. 
if you're putting in, you know, a uh, five foot branch layering and you're putting four feet of that thing into the ground, you're pretty much going to be in the, in the zone where there's some water. Uh, and I've, I've always seen them survive really well. So you can go from obligate all the way up to fat upland, up into the up, up, upland a little bit. I've seen them also used in riparian areas. Good success. Okay. And we've got one more question that just came in here, and that is, are there any recommended plants for deep shade? Deep shade. Um, you know, actually, uh, Red Ozier Dogwood likes to deep shade, um, but it also has to be kind of uh, very rich soils. Um, that's one thing that um, Red Ozier Dogwood likes is rich kind of damp soil, but it, it grows fairly well in um, uh, deep shade. Another one that grows well is also elderberry. As far as tree shrub species, uh, if I was gonna go with, uh, or tree species, uh, if I was gonna go with something that would grow in the shade, it'd be a silky willow, maybe a uh, shining willow or something like that. I think those would do well. Great. All right, Greg, well, that's all the questions we had come in. So I think we're good and we we're just a couple minutes over our timing. Oh, we've got one more that just came in here. Uh, it is uh, from Tyler Feely. Is there a best practice for combating invasive species in the area, such as vines? Um, I've always recommended uh, pre-invasive species removal before the project. Um, and then uh, in the last 10 years or so, I've always recommended that uh, wh whoever has designed the project or whoever is the stakeholders that they, they put in a, um, a budget for invasive species removal as the project goes on, because it, it, they're always going to come in no matter what. And the quicker you can get on to a site, assess what's happening, and uh, removal of the invasive species, it's much easier than waiting two or three years down the line and all of a sudden you have, you know, uh, grapevines or whatever uh, smothering out your project. Great, all right. Well, thanks again, Greg. I think we fielded all the questions. Uh, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Hopefully uh, you learned something valuable. Uh, that you can take back out to your workplace and uh, the sites that you're working on coming up. Uh, if you have any questions or any feedback, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we don't have a survey that we're going to pop up here on the screen, um, but we will probably send you a follow-up email just to basically see uh, what you thought about this webinar and maybe even get some suggestions from you for future topics as we do intend to continue doing these moving forward. So. Uh, Look for emails from us uh, to find out how we did and also to keep you updated on some future topics. So thank you once again, every, everybody. We appreciate you coming and joining us today and hopefully we'll see you again on the next webinar. Take care. Thanks a lot.